Welcome back to part 5, How I Built My Pole Barn Shop. When we ended the last video, this is roughly what the shop looked like. In keeping with the vintage outside look that I desired, the idea of including these three gooseneck lights on the east end seemed appealing. The porcelain covers are original antiques that I purchased as scrap from a local scrap metal business. I rewired and attached each to a steel pipe that I bent to form the gooseneck. Since they did not originally have a ground wire, I added that as well. Here you can see the three goosenecks when powered up. The goosenecks are controlled by two three-way switches, one located at the small entrance door and the other at, by the large garage door. They make for a very nice outside front light. Besides goosenecks, I also installed floodlights on the other three outside walls. One switch turns all the floods on if I ever need to walk around the shop at night. Here you can see highlighted where the two floods are located on the north wall outside. Also the roughed in wires for the corner light that would later become part of the path lights between the shop and my house that we've already talked about. Each of the outside walls also received GFCI outlets. The north and south walls each have two outlets, while the east and west end walls got one each. This is the northeast corner of the shop. You can see the white three-quarter inch water lines coming up through the concrete floor from the outside trench. All four PEX lines are identified in this photo. The middle line comes from the house and provides water to the shop. The far left line feeds water back outside around the shop and eventually into the bathroom located in the southwest corner of the shop. The right line feeds to an outside faucet directly through the wall. And the upper horizontal line on the right is roughed in for a possible sink location a few feet away. Since the bathroom will also have a sink, I haven't decided whether to install one here as well. However, it's a lot easier to rough in a line before the wall panels go up than it is to pull them off later. A drain to go outside for that potential sink was also roughed in under the window. Each line has its own shutoff valve. There's also one at the house and the bathroom. Just to the left of the white PEX lines, you can also see the gray electric wire that powers the path lights. As you may recall from an earlier video, the path light wire and water lines are all buried in the same underground trench. If you look closely, you can see that both the wire and the PEX lines come up through gray plastic electric conduit. I used some scrap conduit as a shield when the concrete floor was poured. If the PEX or the wire ever have to be replaced, the conduit will make it much easier to pull out the original line and replace it while that have to bust up the concrete floor. You can also see a water spot on the floor. That was from one of the new shutoff valves that turned out to be faulty in the very first week of use and I had to replace it. PEX line is really strong stuff, it almost never freezes or leaks, but if you do have an issue it's going to be where a connection is made and that's what happened here. This was a brand new shutoff that failed the first time it was used. Unfortunately, as we all know, quality manufacturing is a thing of the past. Cheap pop metal, inferior tolerances, material defects, they have unfortunately become the norm. While we're at this location, I also wanted to mention something about the baseboard. When I ordered the vertical white panels that would ultimately cover the inside walls, I ordered them pre-cut to the exact length minus a half inch to account for slight deviation for the floor or the ceiling at any particular point. However, when I went to install the first panel, I found it was too short. And then to my horror, I realized they were all too short. What happened was, at the place I took the measurement, I had previously nailed a two before on the wall up against the ceiling. And when I measured for ceiling height, my tape got stuck under the two before instead of going all the way to the ceiling. So all the wall panels were three and a half inches too short. In the end, the lemon was turned into lemonade with this baseboard. 
I just ran a two before around the bottom of each wall. And that was then covered with some scrap five to six foot long white aluminum pieces bent into an S shape to cover the two before. By resting the individual wall panels on the two before, they were now exactly the correct height. In this picture, you can see the baseboard with the panel installed. At the end of the day, I was delighted with the baseboard as I should have engineered that in to begin with. What the baseboard does is what all baseboards do, it provides a buffer. When something is rolled over against the wall, it hits the baseboard first, rather than running into the wall and denting or scratching the wall metal. Another benefit of the baseboard is that it provided a nice finished professional look. Instead of the wall panels resting on the concrete floor, they now had a nice line of demarcation with the baseboard. So fortunately, this was one measuring mistake I was ultimately glad I made. This later photo of numerous outlets and switches perfectly leads us into a discussion of the electrical. Here the walls are 10 feet in either direction, but you can see in just this one area there are five lower outlets about 14 inches off the floor. The sixth box under the window is actually a junction box. Then above them at waist level are four switches, one 220 volt outlet and three double 115 volt outlets. This is sort of a microcosm of the entire shop. A great deal of time was spent in design and installation of the electrical. It was one area I especially paid close attention. The first thing I did was to draft this simple drawing. And from that, I designed the various circuits showing where outlets would be placed. For most circuits, I used 12-2 Romax to create 20 amp circuits. And for others, I used 14-2 wire to create some 15 amp circuits. It just so happened I had some extra 14-2 wire and decided to use it up. Otherwise, I would have used 12-2 throughout. My goal was to have easy electric access anywhere in the shop. This photo of the north wall is a good example. Because vertical wall beams were placed every 10 feet, I decided to space inside outlets at least every 5 feet with one 220 volt outlet every 10 feet on this particular wall. In addition, I wanted two levels of outlets. Some tools naturally plug in low on the wall and some higher up. And anyone who has a shop knows that where you place a workbench that numerous outlets are needed. You might need one for a clock, a grinder, a small drill press, a radio, whatever. There is just often a need for a half dozen outlets wherever you have the workbench. So the beauty of this shop layout is that no matter where a workbench is set up, there is adequate electrical and that there's 220 available there as well. Perhaps you noticed that each outlet is numbered in this photo and that there are blow-ups of two outlets not yet covered with wall metal. Photos like this serve two purposes. First, as mentioned before, they provided a library of information. If I later have to modify something related to electrical, I can refer to pictures like this and see exactly what was done. The second reason is that this provided documentation to the electric inspector that I had complied with code. He initially saw and inspected where I roughed in the wiring for all the outlets. However, I could not physically attach each box to the walls until I placed each metal wall panel. And the reason for that was that the outlets had to be placed between the panel ribs and not on a rib. So as I would put up the next wall panel, I would measure between the ribs, orient the outlets in their proper location, attach them, cut the holes in the wall panel, and then install the panel. I would also take a picture like this to document that the box was indeed properly attached, that grounding was properly done, and that the wires coming into the box on either side were stapled within six inches to meet code. I'm not going to show you all these, but here is just one more example of pictorial documentation that identifies each wire, what circuit it's related to, and what it controls or where it goes. This photo of the southeast corner of the shop shows where two specialized 220 volt plugs were installed for welders. One is for a spot welder and the other is for a stick, TIG, or a MIG welder. I placed a wall switch controlling an upper outlet like you see here on each of the four walls. These upper outlets are for things like a clock, 
a lighted advertising or whatever. The last half of the build, this was often the scene inside the shop. I would bring in a dozen or so of these 20 foot insulation boards to let them dry. They were stacked outside and they would get wet in the rain. Then they would be slowly cut up with a handsaw as required to insulate walls. One thing worth mentioning is that with metal panels on both the outside and inside walls, that also meant there were sta staggered horizontal 20-foot tubifores both inside and outside like you see here. This extra bracing resulted in what I believe is a very strong structure. The insulation seen here between the bracing represents the fifth layer of insulation on this north wall. That is seven and a half inches of board insulation or nearly a 38 R value. I had some extra insulation boards so this wall got a little more than some of the other walls. We've already talked about putting up the outside wall panels and you've seen many pictures of some of the inside panels already in place. So except for a few sequential pictures here, I'm not going to retrace the steps of installing all the inside wall panels. Suffice to say that with all the measuring and the electrical boxes that required cutouts, I can install a little over two panels per day. Each panel was attached with over 80 screws, over half of which were over my head. So that was a fair amount of time climbing up and down just to do that. It was of course extremely gratifying to see the walls completed because then it really did start to look like a shop. As the last of the north wall metal panels were being placed, this nautical light was also installed over the entrance door. It took me about a half day to build a special box in which it was then attached to the wall. There were several small unique parts I had to engineer in order to make it work. Here you can see the red light when it was first turned on. The nautical light is a warning light wired into the attic lights. The attic lights are not visible from the outside of the building or from inside the shop. If they ever got left on accidentally, they might stay on for six months or a year because the attic is not a place often visited. Now I know the local power company wouldn't care, but since I pay the electric bill, this was a fairly important feature to add. At this point, I was finally ready to finish closing in the shop. A commercial clope pull-up garage door was purchased from Home Depot. I forget the R value, but it had the most insulating value that they sold at that time. Like with most everything else, I decided to install the door myself. Directions were clear as a bell, which makes me wonder why I had to read it about 20 times to figure it out. But I finally got it. Most of it really wasn't that difficult. The most challenging part was installing the overhead rails. And the reason for that was because I had to engineer and then make parts to hold the rails in place to the ceiling. Since I had several banks of lights running across the ceiling, I had to engineer around those. And while doing so, there were critical angles that had to be considered so the door would work properly. Here you can see some of the pieces that had to be cut, drilled, and ready to be bolted together on the ceiling. They were quite time consuming to make and each part was unique. I ended up using 3 inch angle galvanized steel that I had on hand for the brackets. I suppose they were about 12 gauge, maybe not quite an eighth inch thick, which means they were more than adequate for the job. Another challenge was up in the attic. As you can see in this picture, 2 by 6 bracing had to be built at four different locations between the trusses to hold the brackets that went through the ceiling and then held the overhead rails. By far, the most dangerous part of the garage door build was tightening the overhead spring. People have been killed when tightening springs when not done properly. I went on YouTube and watched a few others explain what to do and what not to do. I also paid particular attention to the directions. I was ultra cautious, did as directed, and fortunately it all worked out. It was very satisfying when the shop was finally fully enclosed and that door went up and down the first time. If you liked this video, gleaned a few ideas, and want to see how the build proceeded, please hit the like button and go to part 6 of how I built my pole barn shop. Remember, 
Before adopting any idea, be sure to run it by a qualified professional. And if you're contemplating a project, good luck, and thanks for watching.